in my full-time gig, I work in the School of Chemical Sciences. I do career services. And I found that a lot of our students really needed some of the soft skill type things around etiquette, professionalism, and so forth in order to really be successful in securing their jobs. And so from that, I actually started my own business called Game Changing Etiquette. And so now this is what I do on the side still. I am still full-time in career services. But I found that this can definitely help set you above other people. And honestly, most of it is probably things you're already doing. You just maybe haven't thought about it. So I want to preface and start by saying etiquette is not about a whole big long list of rules. Yes, I'm going to give you a bunch of rules today, but ultimately that's not what etiquette is about. Etiquette really is about just treating other people with respect. Giving them sort of that um, how I wish I were going to be treated and treating other people that way. And etiquette is just, the rules around etiquette are just what kind of give a framework for us to know what respect looks like. So I'm going to share a lot of that today with you, uh, and I am also highly interruptible. So as I'm talking, if there's a question that you have that you're thinking, mm, I don't want to ask this because I don't want to sound dumb, you probably will find that at least one other person in this room has that same question. So jump in, raise your hand, ask me throughout the session today. I also will leave some time at the end if you've got additional questions you didn't want to ask in front of everybody, or even if you just have something that you think of towards the end, that you can certainly ask me then as well. So you definitely have some opportunities today to get the things answered that you really are wondering about. Basically, I want to start by talking about what professionalism really is, because I think we have this sort of skewed view of professionalism being somebody in a stuffy three-piece suit. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I also want to share um, a little bit about some general principles around etiquette, talking about how you can make a positive first impression. Believe it or not, if you go into a job interview, typically an employer is making a second, literally split second decision about whether or not they want to continue on with the interview with you. And if you don't present yourself positively in that first couple of seconds, it's going to be a quick interview. They're going to probably ask the questions that they absolutely have to ask, and then they're going to kick you out because they're not going to follow through with you. The fact that you all are, all are here today means that you must do something right. I assume most of you have been interviewed at least to get into your internship role this summer. That being said, sometimes different recruiters look for different things. So having that positive first impression is important. Part of that is attire. So I'm going to talk about that. Of course, that's sort of industry or even organizational specific. Uh, but a lot of it is about how you communicate. So I'm definitely going to spend some time on that today. Uh, I also want to talk about things specific with communication. So how do you greet one another? Do you have a good handshake? Uh, how do you talk on the phone? And how do you communicate via old school email? Some of those pieces. Um, and then finally, of course, social media. And that includes pretty much anything. Uh, if you are a working professional, which you all are now, social media is going to play a part. So I'm going to talk about, in general, how do you stand up positively? How do you make a good impact on other people? How do you treat other people with respect? I love this quote by Mark Twain. He basically says that etiquette requires us to admire the human race. And because etiquette is about respect and treating others with care, that's super true. Uh, etiquette is about uh, admiration. Like, if you don't have some kind of a respect or admiration for other people, you can't treat them properly. Right? If you don't care about anybody but yourself, you're not going to care about treating somebody else properly. Now, of course, in the end, it's going to come back to hurt you, too. So it's good to do that. So professionalism has two parts. One is specific to your field. So it's going to be learning and growing within your specific whatever it is that you're doing, your job. Uh, so what skills are important? What ethics are related to that type of field? Um, how do you dress for that type of organization and so forth? You have to be thinking of a growth mindset. So keeping your skills current. How can you continue to learn and grow and develop? That is professionalism. So when you think about professionalism being that guy in a three-piece suit, obviously it's much more than that. Professionalism is also about something that applies across the board, and that's kind of where that etiquette piece falls in. Being attentive, caring about other people, thinking about other people's needs, and so forth. Um, be, be, behaving in a courteous way. How can I care about somebody else more than I care about myself? Now that doesn't mean to the point of I'm going to let myself be abused. 
I would never encourage you to do that. Um, but abuse and putting others first are not the same thing. So thinking about that in general. So a couple of rules about professionalism at work. Generally, you want to be using work resources for work things. So that even goes so far as saying that one pen, unless your boss says yes, so it's got a logo on that we want you to take it home and share the work, share with the world. Um, otherwise, work resources for work only. That includes your time. That includes using the computers. So if you are not the social media person for your organization, don't spend time on social media when you're on your work hours. Um, that also means things like cell phone use. Um, paying attention if you're in more of a cubicle or an open work environment. How does what I'm doing, whether I'm clicking on my pen or eating or popcorn or whatever, how does that impact the people around me? Thinking about that. Uh, and then also with, with cell phones, if you uh, are okay and you're an organization that's fine with you taking breaks here and there, doing personal phone calls, that's awesome. But make sure you're not doing those personal phone calls where everybody can hear you. Nobody wants to know about your doctor's appointments. Uh, adhere to and don't complain about safety rules. This is probably a little more true in my field. So I work with chemical sciences, um, labs, that kind of thing. So obviously, if you are not adhering to safety rules in a lab, that could be really dangerous for you and a lot of other people. Um, so making sure that if your organization has rules around safety, that they're probably there for a reason, so they're not arbitrary, they're not things that you could just say, whatever. I would also recommend not calling negative attention to yourself. Of course, you need to be you. But if you doesn't fit with the organization where you're working, then I would say look for a different job. Instead of you trying to say, no, I should be able to dress the way I want. Um, so I, I should be able to wear open toe shoes if I'm in a lab. Well, no, you can't do that. You need to follow along to the rules. So make sure you're not calling the negative attention to yourself. One of those things about negative attention is about how you react to time and how you interact with time. Now, certainly things happen. You know, sometimes you're finishing up this late minute project and you just can't get to a meeting when you're supposed to or whatever. But in general, you want to make sure you're on time or even a few minutes early. And you want to make sure you stay through the duration of the meeting unless you let the meeting host know in advance. Not just for things like this, but if you've got a meeting and you're with other people, they may think, gosh, you're leaving early, so you must not care about us. Even if your meeting was supposed to be done at 3 and now it's 3.30 and you, you know, get up and leave. Generally, unless you let them know in advance, I have another meeting at 3.30, I need to have this wrapped up by that time, then that would be different than if you just get up and leave and that basically is telling the people that you're meeting with, you don't care about them and their time, your time is more important than they are as people. <clears throat> Learn to be a good listener. Who in here by your face of hands would say, yeah, I'm a pretty good listener? Okay, awesome. Honestly, probably most of us, even people who are really good at listening, can always use a refresher. So thinking about what the other person is saying as opposed to you thinking about what you're going to say next. Believe it or not, that can be one of the biggest skills to make you and your boss look good. So if you're talking to someone and you're demonstrating like I'm thoroughly listening to somebody else before I'm jumping in thinking of what I'm going to say, that really shows care for another person. Uh, teamwork is important. Of course, I know you've heard of that in your classes and um, probably even here at work. But that's more than just like, hey, I'm going to help if, if I'm done with my job. Uh, that's more of an attitude than it is an actual action. So it can be things like, um, sharing ideas or helping out on projects or yes, I finished with all my jobs so I'm going to help somebody else. Um, but it can also be things like showing initiative. Now there's a right, right way and a wrong way to show initiative. If you're going out and saying, I want to do this and I think we need to do this and anybody who doesn't do this is dumb. That's not initiative. But saying, hey, I've got this great idea or I've got this project. What do you think? Is this something we could work on? Does this make sense? Is this in alignment with the organization? That kind of thing. That's initiative. Um, and then, of course, if somebody uh, hears your idea or whatever and tries to steal from you or you steal from somebody else, then that's never good. Now, does it happen? Unfortunately, yes, it does. Um, but just don't be that person. So, um, yeah, so then there, there was kind of saying, like, I have an idea for a new whatever, something that's related to the role or the organization. Can I work on that? This one I think is really important, too. So um, this is unfortunately not something that I learned until I was later in my career. I was great at coming up with ideas for people, like, hey, maybe you should have done this, or this one worked better. 
Um, but I used to just be like, we should do this, or this would be better. What I learned is instead of saying, hey, here's the problem, and giving it to somebody else to fix, if you come to them and say something like, hey, I've got this problem, I think either this or this might be possible solutions, what do you think? That does everything. That presents your solutions, that brings buy-in from the other people or from your boss, um, but it still also says, hey, here's a concern, here's an issue. So it kind of takes away that, um, makes you more assertive than it is makes you aggressive. So assertive, good, aggressive, bad, obviously. The final thing I would say is always try to think outside of the box. Um, I think we, we tend to get sort of stuck on um, this is the way it's always been done or whatever, but especially since y'all are younger and you've got great ideas, you're in school, many of you, so you've got these things that you're learning, be sure and be willing to share those things. And do share them. Just like we share documents on Docs, you want to share things there too. Uh, and then finally, I would say if you are working on something and you're not the right person or you can't actually solve somebody's problem, instead of saying, oh, that's not my job or I can't help you with that, try to find somebody who can. Take them to someone who can answer that problem, if possible. All right, so I talked about first impressions a little bit. First impressions do matter. And uh, not just at job interviews. The problem is a lot of organizations are spending tons of money on training people, making sure you have all the knowledge. But if you come in as a customer and they're some, someone who's rude to you or they're, they're presenting some otherwise a bad first impression, all of those millions of dollars are for waste. Um, so yes, the good news is negative first impressions can be overcome, but it takes a lot. Because once we have that first impression of something in our mind, it really sort of cements itself. So try to create a positive one in the first place. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is some of the rules that I'm gonna, about to go into will be more specific for business settings or work settings than they would be if you're hanging out with your friends. So I'm going to talk about email for a lot. Probably a lot of you don't use email at all um, with your friends. But in work situations and school situations, it's still something you need to do. Um, so, again, all these things are important for success. Um, you have to have the skills, you have to have the experiences. But if you are coming at something and you're treating people rudely or, or you're being unprofessional or you're being loud, and, um, whatever the case might be, not having that social savviness, that actually will hurt you either in getting a job or in keeping one. So, as I said at the very beginning, all of these rules I'm about to share with you aren't really just about the rules, it's really more about the respect. All right, so H. Jackson Brown had this great quote that I really like um, when he said that good manners sometimes mean simply putting up with other people's bad manners. So it's sort of like taking the high road. You all are probably going to have learned some things, hopefully at least one new thing today, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can go out and tell everybody else at work, oh, you're doing that wrong, because then that is sort of the antithesis of what treating other people with respect is all about. So learn these things, and if you're supervising someone later on in, down the road or teaching someone by all means, let them know. But if it's a friend or if it's certainly if it's your boss, you don't get to correct. All right, so what are some of those things? Uh, as you're meeting people, those first impressions are so crucial. Make eye contact. If that's not something you're comfortable with, practice with some friends, because that shows genuineness and sincerity and it's important. Uh, people want to trust you. If you're helping someone, make sure you're not talking with someone else or talking about someone else. So if someone is coming into your organization, for example, that's just kind of basic customer service. Um, and then certainly if there's a client around, don't talk about another client, don't talk about your boss. Uh, make sure that you are engaging only with the conversation that you're in. Um, I actually even heard something one time about someone who's kind of bragging on themselves. Like, hey, I'm, I'm super awesome, I know I'm really great. Uh, but was in earshot of someone who was looking at them for a potential job. And because of them kind of bragging, I mean, they probably were really great at what it was that they were doing, but because they were sort of bragging on themselves, the, the potential supervisor was like, yeah, we don't really want that kind of person in our organization. Uh, does it fit with our cast? Does it fit with our group? And so um, it's important to kind of guard your tongue, if you will. Um, don't keep working if somebody comes in and is needing something. Obviously, I think that's kind of a given, and that's probably more of, for those of you who are in any kind of a customer-facing, you know, up here type, front desk type role. Um, and then this one's kind of a basic one. 
Uh, a lot of times we think, oh yeah, well somebody stops and, and they, they run into our you know, space up here at Enterprise Works that they're really needing to go down the hall and around the corner. They just ended up in the wrong place. Don't just say, you gotta go down the hall and around the corner. If you can actually spare it and spare the time away from your project to at least step out in the hallway with them and point them in the right direction, or even better yet, take them. Nope, they're not your customer, they're not your client, they weren't really needing your organization, but they're going to remember that. And that extra trust and respect makes a huge difference. Uh, along with those same lines, trust and respect, if you promise something, follow through with it. So if you tell your boss or you tell your customer or whomever, yes, I'm going to finish this by such and such date, or I'm going to do this in this way, make sure you're following through with that. That's our word and that's our integrity and that's a lot about our character. And so if you're not having good character in the workplace, that job will probably get you to the end of the term, the end of the contract, but it won't get you any further. And then when it comes time for getting a reference from that supervisor, yeah, they were a good employee, but I wouldn't hire them. So you don't want that to follow you. Uh, the same thing about attire is just don't let your clothes speak more loudly than your words and your actions. Whatever that looks like, I know that that's going to be different from organization to organization. It's also going to be different from setting to setting. Obviously, you would dress a little bit more formally if you're in a job interview than your day to day on the work. But I always say you have to be able to. Sure, you can go on MLB.com. Sorry for your Cardinals fans, but uh, you can go to MLDB.com and buy a Cubs jersey, uh, but it's not the same thing until you actually make the Cubs team. So if you're an actual Cubs player, you get to wear the real uniform. If you're not on the team, you don't get to wear their uniform. Same thing with the job search process. You can go to MLB.com and, and buy a uniform that's going to get you to the interview, but you don't get to dress like at work until you're actually on that work team. So don't wear that for interviews. Uh, how you dress does not just um, show respect for yourself, but also for the people who are around you. I used to tell students, dress the way your boss dresses, um, unless your boss is a complete slob, which sometimes bosses are. So then I would say, dress a little bit better than your boss. But don't, if your boss is literally, if your boss is wearing t-shirt and jeans or t-shirt and shorts every day to work, I probably wouldn't recommend that you wear a three-piece suit to work. Uh, just because then that culture fit is going to be so um, uh, in discongruous that you, it's not going to be a good fit. So find out the dress code in advance. What's expected? What does that look like for your particular organization? No matter what that would be, I would say at work, try to minimize bare skin. Y'all look great today, but you know some of the clothes that you're going to wear out on a Friday night probably are not the same clothes you should be wearing to work. Details do matter, and details include things like smells. Um, and not just bad smells, I think we all know what bad smells, like I mentioned the burnt popcorn earlier, um, but also good smells. So if you like wearing a lot of perfume or you like that fruity hand soap that, or lotion or whatever you can buy, sometimes that's going to be um, an irritant for somebody who has maybe allergies. So think about those details, think about smells, good or bad. Uh, make sure that people within your organization, within your close space are going to still feel comfortable. All right, and finally, business casual is typically not as casual as they think. It's more business than it is casual. Uh, but I do want to talk about greetings, and before we do that, um, for those of you who are, who are able to, I want you to stand up and shake hands with the person next to you as if you're meeting them for the first time.
come in here and be like overly aggressive and overly confident and try to throw my weight around, neither of those are good. It can also be the politician, which I didn't see anybody doing, so good job. But the politician thing is a two-handed handshake, you know? Grab hands, smack your other hand on there to shake their hand. Why do you think politicians do that? Yeah. It's a power move. It is absolutely a power move, but it's a power move because they feel insecure. It's not a power move because they feel confident. So don't be a politician in your handshakes. But your handshake does create a, a large portion of that first impression. So if you don't know for sure, if you're one of those people who I said maybe needs a little work on the handshake, I'm going to hang out up here after we're done. Uh, come shake my hand, and I will give you an honest feedback and tell you how to fix it. Because that is such a fixable thing. You know, I, I know most of us hate getting bad feedback, but if it's something that you can change super easily, why wouldn't you want to do it? Because then you can have positive going forward. All right, so when you shake hands, if you're able to, you want to stand. You always, no matter what, want to make eye contact. And you actually want to smile. Like, I know some of us aren't big smilers, but when you first introduce yourself to someone, that should be a time to smile. After that, you can kind of go back to your gloomy face if you want. Uh, make sure when you're introducing someone to someone else that you're doing so properly. And people kind of get hung up on this piece. Who knows how to, let's say we've got uh, the CEO of your organization um, and one of your friends you've met here from the intern program, and you're introducing the two of them. Who goes first? Who says whose name comes first? The CEO. Yeah, I heard it. CEO. So what if that same CEO is being introduced to a potential client? Whose name comes first? The client. Yeah, great, good job. So the client is always right, the customer is always right, even if it's these, you know, it's Jeff Bezos, like whoever it is, the CEO of your organization is never more important than the client. The client is always more important. Um, if otherwise you're introducing two people who aren't client and, and customer and so forth, whoever has the bigger title, or maybe who's the older person, those that would be kind of how you would pick it. So title first in a workplace. If everybody's like, you know, you're both interns, then pick the person who's a senior first to name before you say the freshman. And all you have to do is say, Tom, this is Sam. Like you don't have to say, I would like to introduce you to Nothing fancy, just first person who's most important to name first, person who's second most important to name second. The other thing you should have is a good closing. So you have a lot of opportunities this summer to be able to go to networking events, to interact with other people, whether it's other interns or organizations out of here at the research park. But you want to have a good sort of intro. There should be some things you have ready to ask about, ready to talk about, um, and there sh you should also have a good closing. So tell me intros first. What are some things, let's start with the things you should not talk about at those networking events. What are a couple topics not to bring up if you're at a work, network, work networking event? Politics. Politics, absolutely. What else? Religion. Religion, yep. What else? More concerts. I'm sorry, what was that? Concerts. Concerts? Why not? I don't know, it could be uh, Too personal? Okay, all right. So let's just kind of dump that into anything that's too personal. You probably shouldn't be talking about. Um, and that would include health, health, probably. So like, oh, I've got this aching sciatic nerve. Like, that's nobody's business. Um, and probably also money, as not so much in salary, because I think that's good to talk about from a career services standpoint. But like, I love that shirt. How much did you pay for that? Like, that's none of my business, right? Um, I do like your shirt, by the way. Uh, so those are probably some of the general. So anything too personal, politics, religion, things that are going to sort of cause heat. Now maybe that's also the Cardinals Cubs thing, depending on we're both in the cellar right now, so it doesn't matter. But uh, you know, politics or concerts or things that might be super personal. Things that are a little bit more casual, such as what would be good things to talk about. Yeah. The weather. The weather, absolutely. That's a great safe <laughs> one, right? We can all come right in to it. All right, what else? Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah, that's another one we can come right over, right? The traffic, how bad things are, parking. Absolutely. What else? Education. Education, or what you do. You know, what organization are you with and what do you do? 
Here's my favorite. You guys can totally steal it. Um, if somebody's talking about their job, you just say, wow, that sounds really challenging. Because then they feel heard, and they're going to keep talking. And then that's good. If you don't like going to networking things, getting the other person talking is a good key. So, wow, that sounds really challenging. And they'll talk. Now, you can't use it on each other, unfortunately, but use it on anybody that's not here today. All right, what are other safe things? Yeah. What about the exact opposite of that? Like, What's that? If you don't want to keep talking to someone. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about that. Have a closing prepared. You can also steal mine if you would like. I like to put it back on them and to say something like, I can't use this now because you guys won't, I can't use it on you after this, but um, I will say something like, I don't want to monopolize your time, and I'm sure that there are other people here that you'd really like to talk to, but it's been great chatting with you. Because what that does is it sounds like I'm doing them a favor, like you can go now talk to other people, but really I'm saying like, oh, I can't wait to get away from this person. Um, I don't really say that, that quite that badly, but it's a good thing to use. So work on your own exit, your own closing. So saying something like, I don't want to monopolize your time anymore. I'm sure that there's other people here that you want to chat with, but it's been great connecting with you, or maybe can we connect on LinkedIn, or whatever the case might be. Um, whatever social media app you're on, if you use it for work connections, you can do that. But having a closing prepared, memorized, ready to go, so as soon as you get to any networking event, you can feel comfortable actually a real thing. If you've forgotten somebody's name, ask again. And if you find out you said somebody's name incorrectly, apologize later. So, Gerald, wherever you are, I apologize. Uh, all right. Pay attention to what others are saying. That kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier about being a good listener. If at all possible, it's, it's better to think about what they're saying before you're thinking about what I'm going to say. And it is important to learn how to mingle and network. I can guarantee you, you will have, no matter what organization you ever work for that long term, multiple opportunities where this networking thing really leads to somebody. Now, many of us are introverts, myself included. I prefer not to go all the time to all the networking things, but they're important. So set something as a goal for yourself and go. So if you say, okay, I'm going to go to this networking thing, I'm going to meet two new people, and then after half an hour, I'm going to leave. That gives you sort of some assurance, like it's okay, I, I don't have to be here forever. It also gives you a purpose for being there. You can make whatever you want as your goal. So maybe you, you know, I, I really would like some, somebody who can help me you know, gather this one idea I'm looking for at work. Or maybe, back to my chem students, you know, I'd really like somebody who can help tutor me for organic chemistry. Um, so that's why you go to this networking event to try to find whatever it is that you've decided you're looking for. Having an agenda makes networking events much easier to handle. And then finally, with networking events, make sure you're putting your name tag on your right side. The main reason for that is that way when you shake hands, they can look right up that arm to that right shoulder. That also reminds you that you need to make sure you're shaking hands squarely with that person as opposed to like, kind of being off at an angle or something like this. So you want to make sure you're squarely facing the person shaking hands so they can look right up your arm to your, to your right shoulder area to see that name tag. And if your handwriting is illegible, try to use your very best handwriting on that name tag so we can read it. All right, we talked about handshakes a minute ago, but these are all a couple of like really bad examples. Uh, again, make sure that you're using a good, firm handshake. Make sure the webs of your thumbs are all the way up together. You have about three or four good pumps and then you kind of drop it. One hand only. All right, let's talk about on the phone. How many people have ever had to answer a phone at work? Anybody? A couple of you. Okay, no more than that. <clears throat> so there's a few things regarding workplace phone usage that I want to talk about. Um, first of all, incoming calls. Of course, basics. Treat every call like it's important. If you do have somebody who leaves a message, try to respond within one business day. I would also say if you're using a cell phone for work, it's still the same thing. If somebody calls your work cell phone, even if they don't leave a message, you should try to call that number back within one business day. Yes, sometimes it's going to be spam. Still good to call back. Um, include your name and organization of whoever you're working for when you answer the phone at work. Um, so my name is Patricia, so I'll usually typically answer the question like, um, Chemical Sciences Career Services, this is Patricia. Well, I sound just like I answered the phone. 
Um, but make sure that you do that because that way if somebody calls the wrong company, they can kind of correct things. I would also along those same lines not assume that caller ID is, work, is correct. Um, if you're using Teams or whatever, somebody else might be using somebody's computer. So don't just assume and pick up the phone thinking it's your buddy and have it be a work-related thing. Uh, if you do use speakerphone at work or you're in an office where if you don't have your headphones on, you're just using your computer as, the, um, as your audio, make sure that the person who calls you knows that's the case. And if there's somebody else who might be able to hear them, make sure you let them know. If you haven't answered the phone that way, but you're switching to using your computer or whatever, make sure you ask, your, ask their permission first. Um, you don't want them to be like, oh my gosh, whatever revealing thing that they just shared and then everybody in the office can hear it. If, they're, if you're calling someone at an office, um, you're the, at the office, you want to be the last person to hang up. So always let the person who's got that incoming call hang up first. If you're making a phone call, even if you get the wrong person, so maybe you're trying to call an organization and there's um, like a gatekeeper type figure, somebody at a front desk who answers for multiple different organizations or multiple parts of the office or the organization, uh, make sure you always tell them your name first. Even if you know this isn't the person that you need, because they may have information that can help you. We spend a large portion of our time playing phone tag. Generally, you don't get the person you need right away. So if that gatekeeper type person can help you, they're going to do that. Yeah? You had mentioned that for on, uh, incoming calls, that yep. we should let them hang up first. Yes. If we are to call someone, should we be the person to hang up first? Yes. Great question. So if you are calling another company or another organization, and you have made, you have originated the phone call, you should be the one to hang up first. Great question. Uh, so yeah, so let them know who you're calling, who you are, why you're calling, if it's not personal, if it's work-related. Uh, because they might be able to tell you, oh yeah, well they're, they just stepped out for 20 minutes, but they're gonna be back. Whereas if you just ask for that person, then you get voicemail. Uh, also, if somebody happens to walk into your, um, you know, your office or wherever you're working, if you are on the phone, the person that you've called has priority no matter what. If you do have to leave a message, make sure it's a full message. So don't just say, this is Patricia. Even if you're calling somebody who you know probably recognizes your voice, well, you wouldn't say Patricia anyway. Um, but you know, don't just say your name. Make sure you say full name when it's a work situation and leave a full message. Don't talk forever, but do leave a full message. Because most of us don't te te tend to talk on the phone that much, we don't really know how to leave messages. And so you want to be sure that you're leaving a message that gives the person enough information that if they call back and get your voicemail, they can leave the information on your voicemail in many cases that they need. Cell phones, basic stuff. Um, pay attention to the volume of both your ringtone and your voice. You know, don't talk in your outside voice if you're inside. If the call, this one's a, kind of a biggie. So if the call is lost, which happens a lot, calls get dropped when you're on cell phones, um, whoever originated the call is the person who should call back. The reason for this is if you don't know this rule, then both people start calling back the other person and then you get each other's voicemails and then it's you know, kind of this loop. So whoever originates a call on a cell phone, if a call gets dropped, that person should be the one to call back. Uh, the other thing is with your cell phone, don't use it anywhere you would talk full volume to your neighbor. So if you're at you know, any of these places, um, you know, if you're in a theater or a concert or even a board meeting, if you wouldn't have a full volume conversation with the person next to you, you shouldn't use your cell phone for any purpose. Unless somebody specifically says, hey, can you go to your calendar and look up whatever, then it's fine, obviously. If you're in a meeting, and maybe there's a, like a big board, boardroom table, um, your phone should not be there. It should be in your lap, it should be on the floor, it should be in your pocket, somewhere other than on the meeting table. The main reason for that is basically you're saying, this phone is the most important thing in this meeting right now. If it rings and a text, I'm going to be more interested in looking at it than I am about this conversation we're having as a, as a meeting. Same thing goes for virtual meetings. If you're having a virtual meeting, nobody on the other, whatever side of your computer should see your phone at all. <clears throat> um, normal working hours, set those by your organization, but if your organization has not set them, the general rule is you can text one hour before and two hours after sort of your normal working hours, otherwise email is the preferred method to communicate. 
Your organization may have other rules. Always follow what your organization says. The main reason for cell phone concerns is if you are too much on your phone, um, it doesn't show a good so, like, social understanding of other people. In fact, I had a student a couple years ago lose out on a job um, specifically because of how he interacted with his phone and nothing else. Super, super smart PhD student interviewing for a really big company, had a perfect fit with his research to what the organization was doing. Um, pretty decent guy, but because the, there was a dinner as part of the interview, the recruiter said, oh, this isn't formal, just ask whatever questions you want. Um, this is just kind of to get to know you. And so my student was like, oh, cool. I'm going to check to see what's going on back home. So pulls out his phone. And in doing that, one simple action, he showed to the recruiter, I don't really care about you. I'm not interested. I know you said it was informal. I can ask whatever questions I want. I'm more interested in my phone. That was the one thing that stopped him from getting the job. It makes a difference. And not just with old people like me. All right, so email. Um, a lot of you probably don't use email very much, like I said at the beginning. But for work purposes, you really need to. You need to check it. You need to answer it. Um, for school, same thing. Like, a lot of um, corporate America uses email as a mode of communication. Maybe internally you're using Slack or you're using something else, but um, Teams or whatever the case might be. But uh, across the board, people tend to use email still quite a bit. And so it's important that you're there and you're paying attention. Um, a couple quick things about email. Every email you ever send could be forwarded, like it or not. Um, so just be careful what you put in writing. If you're angry, you don't you know, send an email. Um, always make sure that you're using spell check. Reread your messages before you send them. It's okay, depending on the audience, to be a little bit more casual. I'm not necessarily saying you have to use perfect grammar, complete sentences all the time. But if you're talking or interacting with a more formal or old school audience, then you need to. Uh, Brian and I were talking earlier, and I use the ellipsis, which is the, like the three little dots, a lot when I'm communicating, but I work with students. And it's a lot more casual what I do. So if I were to email an administrator on campus, I'm not going to use the same type of um, probably even language or definitely punctuation. So pay attention to your audience and who you're writing to. Uh, and that kind of goes for the same next one, you know, IMs and GIFs and all those kinds of things. Make sure that you're only doing those if the audience is appropriate for that. Uh, keep your messages short. Most of us are reading email on our phones when we are, um, sometimes on a uh, you know, computer or laptop or whatever, but it's still best to keep email messages short. If you're saying like, oh wow, uh, this is getting really long as I'm sending this email, pick up the phone, go next door to the office, whatever. So you want to try to keep your email somewhat short. Uh, and then do use co carbon copy or blind carbon copy, but do so sparingly. Uh, if, if somebody really doesn't have to be, you know, carbon copied five or six, seven different people on a list, you can take their names off and just respond to that one person who initially sent out the email. But if your boss says, I need to be carbon copied on everything you send, again, follow the rules of the organization. <clears throat> um, and then some of you might be using out of office messages, probably more so once you get into your first post school job um, than right now. But if your organization wants you to use out of office messages, they're good to do uh, because it's helpful for somebody to know like, oh, they're not going to get back to me for probably a week because they're out of the office. So use them if your organization encourages it. All right, a few quick things about social media. I actually recommend that you're, you're there, that you have a presence. You don't have to have a presence on every single social media platform that's out there. Um, that's all you would end up doing probably with your time. I would also say though, if you're not the social media person for your organization, that you not get on social media while you're at work. Have a presence, but do so outside of work. Uh, even on the really fun stuff, the TikTok things, like keep it professional. And again, remember professionalism as I described at the beginning. It doesn't mean you are up there doing it, you know, I can't dance on TikTok because I have to be super formal and strict. That's not what professionalism is. Professionalism is about respect, professionalism is about learning and growing. Keep those things in mind. If you're being respectful, then you're achieving the goal. Um, so be present, be active. Be specific, have a plan for your social media. Um, I think that's really helpful too. People sometimes are like, oh, I feel like I should be here, and I feel like I should be here. You don't have to be everywhere, be somewhere, and have that presence. The reason it's important
important is because people, I mean, that's what, how we communicate. Work and, and um, personal sometimes do blur. So it's, it's great to have some type of a presence out there. Be known for something. Hopefully it's something related to something that is you know, positive as opposed to something negative. Um, and along those same lines, I would say use humor cautiously. Uh, humor is great and it's very important and vital in our world, but certain types of humor, like making fun of somebody else or being hurtful to someone else, are never good. Um, even if you're really good at it and you're really funny and people laugh, unless you're a stand-up comedian and that's how you're making your living, um, don't do it on social media. Uh, make a plan, follow the same guidelines, to some extent as email, like actually be there, follow up, uh, make sure people understand what you're trying to say. say. And then finally I would say if you are with other people in person, whatever that looks like, then don't be on social media. Be, be present, be in real life. All right, we talked about networking a little bit, but a couple things I want to sort of share specifically. Um, if you have said you're going to go to something that is asking you to register, you should go. Um, I think we've gotten in our sort of hybrid world really lax on this area, uh, but even like Brian was saying at the beginning, it, it's hard if somebody's you know buying food or setting out chairs or planning an event for someone to say, yeah, I just don't feel like going today. So if you've said you're going to come, come. Now if you're super sick or you have COVID, we don't want your germs, so then in those cases, stay home. But if it's like, eh, I just don't like it, or I just got busy, then that just actually shows poor planning on your own part. So if you've said you're going to come, come. If you have said you're not going to come, don't come unless you ask for permission to come. Um, and then I would encourage you to, like I said, have that opening, have that ending, to go, to show up, to be at the networking event. Be purposeful, have a goal. All those things that I kind of shared earlier are really helpful. Um, and then this final part is um, be a catalyst. So a lot of times people think about networking as like, what can I get out of it? And then that kind of feels slimy, right? It feels like, uh, no offense to people who do this as a pr profession, but like a real sales pitchy thing. Like, I'm just here to try to get you to do something for me. If you can think about networking as how can I be a catalyst to somebody else? How can I make things better? Um, how can I connect other people to resources or to other people or something like that? Then it becomes more about a giving mindset. How can I support the people I'm around as opposed to a taking mindset? It's going to make you feel better about going to networking events, and it's actually going to make you a lot more successful too. Um, and then finally, just like I said before, if you are in real life with people, don't hide behind your technology. If people actually have business cards or LinkedIn QR codes, which if you're not on LinkedIn, I, know, I think you guys are doing, are you doing a LinkedIn thing this summer? It was our first one. Oh, first. so for those of you who went to the LinkedIn thing already, um, make sure you're on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a really great professional um, social media platform. So you can set up a QR code through the app that you can use to connect with other people if you don't use paper business cards, but connect with people and then follow up. One of the final things I want to talk about is thank yous. So unfortunately, one of the things that we have lost the art of is learning how to appreciate other people. And then part of that is saying thank you. So it's good to do that, and you will be remembered if you express appreciation. So send a quick little email. Hey, thanks for um, doing this favor for me. Or thanks for, you know, send a message to Ryan or to any of the interns that helped set up today's session. Hey, thanks for providing food. Yeah, they're doing this because they want to encourage you to come and they want to have you, you know, connect with other people. But sometimes it's hard with the university to actually pay for food. So the fact that they're going through the trouble of doing that, send them a thank you note. Stop by afterwards as they're standing around in the back and say thank you. Um, if you have a job interview, absolutely. If you want the job, send a thank you. Email is fine. You don't not have to write a you know handwritten old school, um, but I would do that within 24 hours. If you can. 48 is kind of the, the sort of tip off, um, but 24 is much better. And people are making really fast hiring decisions these days, and so if you can send a message just saying I appreciated learning about X Y Z, I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with your organization, that shows that you're really interested, and they're going to be more apt to say Yeah, okay, we want you too. Uh, favors, if somebody does something for you, I would send that email within a week. If somebody does something really big for you, writes a recommendation letter, for example, I would probably go old school and actually handwrite them. Just a little note, stick it under their door, mail it if you need to. Um, if somebody gives you an actual gift, 
you, if you're not there in person to thank them, make sure that within two weeks you send, again, handwritten thank you notes. Um, if you're getting married, you have a little bit more flexibility. You could actually have three months in that case because they figure you're going to go on a honeymoon or whatever the case might be. Um, but if somebody sends you a gift, somebody does a favor for you, you will be remembered if you send a handwritten thank you note and in a positive way. So what happens if all of these things you've learned and you still do something wrong? You spill the food, you spill the whatever, you forget to shake hands well. What do you do? Has anybody ever in your life made some type of a faux pas that you're like, shoot, I wish I would have done that? Raise your hand. Oh, come on. Everybody raise your hands. Everybody in here has done it. I have too, myself, many times. Um, and I teach this stuff. So it happens, right? Things just aren't, that's life. Things aren't going to go as planned. Uh, remember, you're only human and it is okay. Uh, it's not only what you did wrong. It's also about how you sort of recover afterwards. So apologize. Now, I'm going to say only apologize once. Um, don't overdo the apology. So I had a student um, who was in a, in a classroom that had a total no tolerance for cell phones policy. And of course, as it happened, she forgot to turn off her cell phone, so it rang in class. Um, so she shut it off right away and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, but then she went up to the professor afterwards and apologized again. I think that's probably fine. She should have stopped it there. But she did it. She went back to her residence hall and she sent an apology as an email. And then the next day in class, or two days later in class, she apologized again before class. So the professor was like, okay, this is, and then he remembered her cell phone going off. That's all he remembered about for her the rest of the semester, right? Because she really over-apologized. So definitely apologize. Whatever, once is fine, don't overdo it. Um, and then finally, don't get so stressed out about all, three, all these little rules I talked about that you forget about interacting, that you forget about the actual conversation, the actual interaction. That's always way more important. Um, so again, another sort of ending with a quote, um, that manners, Emily Pope's is sort of the queen of, queen of manners. Manners are a sensitive awareness of the feelings of other people. So it's caring about other people. Yes, we give you the rules, but the rules are just there as a framework. So etiquette is about caring about other people. And if you do that, you're going to take care of them in many of those ways that we talked about today. Here's my contact information. If anybody wants to connect on LinkedIn or if you've got questions, feel free to reach out. I'm also happy to address questions now. I can guarantee you, like I said at the beginning, somebody else in the room probably has the same questions. So questions that y'all have. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you said about networking and networking on that subject. Um, I know for me, and I think other people can relate, um, it might be like it's a way to go up to people and network. So do you have any advice for some people to kind of get out of their shell and introduce them? Yeah, so the question was, um, are there recommendations for how do you get out of your shell? Because it is overwhelming for many of us going to a networking event. Um, I would say one of the things is remember that probably more people are feeling the way you're feeling than feeling the other way. I do a lot of really big group presentations, over 100, 200, 300 students. Um, and I'll often say, okay, hey, raise your hand if you love walking into a room of 400 strangers. It all went, okay, I've got a couple. But that's typically the case. There's a couple. In a room of 500, I might have four or five. So the majority of people don't love walking into these rooms of strangers. So knowing that first is helpful. Um, I would say look for that person who's standing by themselves because knowing that most people don't feel comfortable, they probably feel really uncomfortable because they're standing there and no one is talking to them. So they're often the first person you can kind of go up to introduce yourself. Prepare. Just like you would prep for a test, prepare for a networking event. What am I going to ask first? Okay, I'm going to ask about the weather. Um, how do you introduce yourself? I've got a good handshake. I know that. I'm just going to walk up to them and say, hi, I'm Patricia Simpson, or your names. Um, so have that prepared and say, what do you think about this conference or the food or the weather, whatever the case might be. So practice what you're going to say. There's nothing wrong with that. If you have a good, strong opening, you look for that person who probably feels even worse than you do right now because they're out by themselves, it's going to go really smoothly. So start that way. Have a good, strong start. It'll make the rest of it a lot easier. And then I would say, like I said, have an agenda that gives you a purpose for being there. Part of the reason that we don't like networking events is we don't really know what they're about or why we're supposed to be there. So create an agenda yourself. Great question. Any others? Yeah. Yeah. 
So in a workplace, when a boss or the CEO get very angry, <laughs> or you you are faced with a customer uh, who is very rude, mm -hmm. so what would you do? <laughs> yeah. So if you have a boss or a customer who's angry, who's yelling, um, you know, first of all, I would say. If this is on a regular basis and they're just that way and that's kind of what you're dealing with all the time, evaluate whether that's a place you want to stay. Um, but if it's a one-time thing, if you get angry as well, that's just going to fuel. It's going to, like, you're throwing a bunch of things onto a fire. It's going to make it a lot worse. Um, saying, I understand, I'm sorry if it was something that you screwed up, apologize. Um, keep your voice as low and calm, even if you don't feel low and calm inside. Uh, and try to respond with what, what's going on with the situation. Uh, typically, the only way to really diffuse an angry customer, I mean, if you can't actually do what they're asking you to do, um, so, you know, you can say, well, I'll look into this. I'm not sure we can do this, but I, I want to help you. Make sure that they seem or they feel heard. That makes a difference, too, because sometimes that anger is because people are feeling helpless. Um, I was actually at the airport um, up at O'Hare, and there was this dad who came up who had missed a flight to Barcelona. Um, I was standing in line at the service help desk because we had missed our flight back into Champagne. But he was really angry and was screaming and yelling and all the service agents kind of went and they turned their backs on him. And um, that just made him yell even more. Now everybody, the whole line was staring at this guy. I'm sure he probably didn't want everybody staring at him. Um, he was just, he felt helpless. Um, and finally, this one person came over to him and said, you know, I'm sorry that this happened to you, um, but please calm down so that I can help you and talk with you. And he was, he was like, yeah, you're right. I just met you. Um, I forget what he said. I just met you. I shouldn't be yelling at you. I'm sorry. But it calmed him down enough to actually have a conversation. Ironically, my husband and I ended up in the taxi cab going to the hotel with um, this man and his son. And he... He was like, oh yeah, this happened to us, and how awful. And I said, yeah, we heard you. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So sometimes people are just jerks. Sometimes they feel out of control. The out of control ones are a lot easier to handle. The jerks, you might just have to leave. I know that was probably a much longer response than you were seeking, but. All right, well, you guys are free to go, but I'm gonna stick around up here for two reasons. Like I said, come shake my hand, and if you have any other questions, please come ask. Um, feel free to connect with me if you have to get back to work, but you still have questions, I'm happy to answer those via email too. Thanks for coming out today.